Okay, great. So I'm going to talk about tenant transfers and kind of the basics, indications, and some of my pearls for success as we move forward. So I don't have any disclosures related to this topic. I am on the ASSH Council and the Education Director, uh, director as was mentioned. Uh, and then these are other companies that I've done a variety of things with, but nothing related to uh, tenant transfers. So I'd like to start this off with a case example. This is a 28 year old gentleman, think about a stab wound to the left upper arm about nine months ago. It's left with a radial nerve palsy. So how do you decide what to do? What's the role for nerve repair, nerve grafting, role for nerve transfers and tendon transfers? And how do you go through the process and figure out what you need to do to help this patient and restore their function? And so if you look at the video here, you can see he can flex the fingers a little bit difficulty extending the wrist. You can kind of get up to neutral. And when he starts to extend the wrist, just past neutral, the fingers fall into flexion. So good flexion of fingers. You can have good opposition to the thumb and can abduct and adduct the fingers. As he pronates and you see him try to extend here, you can extend the wrist and it kind of goes into radial deviation. So when thinking about the anatomy and understanding what's going on, that'll help us figure out how do we help this patient and what can we potentially do for him? So this is the uh, plan for my presentation this morning or this evening. I'll go over some things about really what tenon transfers are, indications for these, some basic principles, which I'm really gonna highlight and try to give you some of my thoughts and pearls uh, on how to get the best results for this. And these are certainly not things that I came up with, but things that have been uh, proven over time to be very successful. And then classifications, and we'll talk about some specific transfers to uh, get you back home with this. So when you think about a tendon transfer, the idea is we're using a functional muscle tendon unit to replace a lost function. And remember with the tendon transfer, you can restore motor function. This is opposed to a nerve transfer, which has some advantages and sometimes that it's not feasible to do, but that can also improve sensory function. And so with a tendon transfer, the goal is really just motor function. So the indications are the times that you'd think about a tendon transfer. Tendon ruptures, we often see this with rheumatoid or inflammatory arthritis. This is argu arguably much less common now than it has been in the past due to the DMARDs and the better medications, but it certainly can happen with these conditions. And every once in a while, you'll see someone that doesn't have uh, ideal medical treatment, and they end up with tendons that look like this. One of the more common tendon ruptures that occurs is the EPL rupture after a distal radius fracture. And so a tendon transfer can be used to restore uh, thumb extension. Other things that you think about, muscle injury or resection, for example, a traumatic injury to the form where you have loss of the uh, extensor muscles or the flexor muscles, or a tumor resection. Both of those will cause a situation where you have loss of motor function and the tendon transfers are an excellent way to uh, treat that. And then that third broad category is an irreparable nerve injury, whether this is direct trauma to an isolated peripheral nerve, such as a median nerve palsy, a radial nerve palsy, or ulnar nerve palsy. All of these can be irreparable and are treated with tendon transfers. Brachial plexus injuries can be uh, treated, as well as spasticity or spinal cord injuries, traumatic brain injuries, cerebral palsy. Any of these uh, patients can benefit from tendon transfers, and you can often help improve their function dramatically. So these are the eight basic principles of tendon transfer. And again, as I said, these are not things that I came up with, but these are uh, things that have been taught over time and tried and true. So you think about correction of contracture, tissue equilibrium, a straight line of pull, principle of one tendon, one function, need adequate strength and amplitude, a synergistic transfer and expendable donor. So I'm gonna go through each of these uh, and try to explain how I think about this and help myself and uh, those that I teach to understand the principles and how to, get the, how to choose the right transfer and how to get the best result. So when you think about correction of the contracture, you need supple joints with full passive motion. And this has started right at the time that an injury is identified or as soon as you see the patient. We know it's much easier to maintain passive motion uh, than it is to regain motion after a, track, a contracture has occurred. And we know that the post-operative active motion will never be greater than the preoperative passive motion. So you want to passively mobilize the joints, whether it's a situation where you're gonna do a flexor tendon graft or a flexor tenolysis or a tendon transfer to restore function. You want supple joints with full passive motion to maximize your chance of success.
The next one I think about is tissue equilibrium. And when you think about that, I think about mature scars with supple joints, really resolution of edema, and you need healthy tissue for your transfer to uh, be transferred under. So you want to avoid substantial scarring. So for example, if you have a crush injury, loss of substantial tissue along the radial side of the forearm with loss of extensor muscles or extensor tendons, then a transfer such as the FCR to the EDC tendons along the radial side may not be the best treatment because that tendon has to glide uh, smoothly. And if you don't have good quality tissue, you can't. So you either need to think about an alternative transfer such as using the FCU and going around the ulnar side of the form, or potentially resurfacing this with a flap uh, beforehand. Sometimes this can be done with a local flap, sometimes it needs free tissue transfer, but you need to have good quality tissue and tissue that is uh, resolved edema and is supple uh, when you proceed with the transfer. Next one to think about is a straight line of pull. And this really becomes pretty obvious. If you think about this, if I'm gonna pull on these two cords and I pull on the one on top, I have a much better chance of being successful than if I pull on the one on the bottom as far as moving the object. And that's why when you think about in the military, other areas, when you're doing tug of war, you're pulling on a straight line. And that's the way that you create the most mechanical advantage to restore function. So a straight line of pull, you want to release any tethers proximally so that tendon is going in the appropriate direction prior to uh, setting your tension and providing your tenorophy. One tendon, one function. This is another important principle. And when you think about this, the effectiveness is reduced when you transfer if you're trying to provide similar functions. So either even thumb function and finger function, those are a little bit different. And so if you have enough tendons for donor that you can use a separate one, to restore thumb function from finger function, you're going to be much better. And we know that a transfer will only effectively move the joint to which it's most tightly attached. So if you're moving multiple fingers together and you don't have the tension set right on the EDC where you're transferring this, you may end up with a situation where some of the fingers have a little better extension than others based on the uh, tightness of your area for transfer. Strength, this is something important when you think about tendon transfers because you have to have an adequately powered muscle to be able to perform its function that you're looking for at the transfer. And we know that a muscle will generally lose about one grade of strength following the transfer. We also know that denervated muscles that have recovered are generally poor because they're not normal functioning muscles. And we want our donor muscle to be greater or equal to the recipient muscle. So if you take something that's fairly weak and try to do a function that is very, uh, requires a lot of strength, you're not going to be very successful. And to help figure this out, we have this table, which is the relative strength of forearm and hand muscles. And so if you think about the extrinsic muscles around the hand and in the forearm, the strongest are the brachioradialis and the FCU. And these are kind of uh, intuitive if you think about it with what you do. The FCU is important for hammering, for dart throwers motion. Brachioradialis is an important uh, elbow flexor. And these muscles essentially are a relative strength of two or twice as strong as most of the other muscles. Think about the wrist extensor. So the radial as well as the ulnar wrist extensors, ECRL, ECRB, and ECU, these have a strength of about one. So they're about half of what the brachioradialis and the FCU are. Digital flexures, same thing. FPL, FDS, and FDP have a relative strength of about one. And so does the pronator teres and the FCR. The digital extensors are the weakest and they have a strength that's about half or a 0 0.5. And this would be the EDC, the EDQ, and the EIP. So you wouldn't want to try to take a finger extensor and try to use it to power wrist flexion because that finger extensor is just not strong enough by itself. So you need adequate strength of the muscle that you're going to be transferring. The next thing we think about is the amplitude of motion. And so what do I mean by this? Well, it's really the excursion that that muscle has. And I think a good way to remember this is what I've considered uh, the three, five, seven rule. And so that's 30, 50, and 70. Wrist extensors and flexors generally have about 30 millimeters of excursion, while the digital extensors have about 50 millimeters of excursion, and the digital flexors have about 70 millimeters of excursion. And so if you're trying to do something like restoring digital flexion, and you're gonna use a wrist extensor to do this, you're gonna to have to do something to augment that to get from 30 to much closer to 70, or you'll have a very limited flexion after your transfer. 
And what we do with this is increasing the relative excursion by crossing a joint and allowing tenodesis to help augment that amplitude. And because we're crossing the wrist, because we can flex the wrist, that can help augment extension or a wrist flexor can help augment finger extension. And so this is an example uh, of a video, oh no. Oh, it is gonna play, it said cannot play. But this is an example given to me several years ago by Roy Mills, who's a hand surgeon from uh, California that probably many of you know. It shows how each of these two joints move and when independently. And when you try to move them together, you can see what happens if there's a tether. So if you create a tether here on one side, and then you try to move the other side, it won't do it because it's tethered. And so moving one side, for example, into extension will make something else move into flexion and vice versa. And so this is a way that we can actually augment the excursion of a muscle that has less excursion or augment the uh, movement of a muscle that has less excursion to create greater relative excursion, even though the absolute number doesn't change. And here's another example as well. You can see someone with a forceful grip and we know that when we forcefully grip, we generally bring the wrist into extension. And you can see what happens here as we bring the wrist into flexion, we lose strength. And as we flex, those fingers come into extension. So that's a way to use tenodesis to help augment the excursion. And we can see tenodesis with wrist flexion, the fingers extend, with wrist extension, the fingers flex. And that's an important principle when we're thinking about tendon transfers. So this is an example of a patient had resection of a tumor in the forearm. And I apologize, it looks like as I move this, it is not going to play. But what I was trying to demonstrate here is the uh, tenodesis motion. I apologize, I had this working earlier and clearly something has happened in the uh, brief period of time since I ran through this last, last night. Um, the next thing that we think about is a synergistic motion and that's important in uh, a tendon transfer. And so a transfer will become more efficient and easier to use when it's a synergistic muscle. And so a wrist flexor and a finger extensor are synergistic. You think about when we're gonna straighten our fingers out, we'll often bend the wrist. And as I said, when we go into grip, we'll bring the wrist into extension, that'll bring the fingers into flexion. So that's very intuitive. And most patients can learn how to do this transfer fairly easily because they teach them when you make a tight fist, this is what you do. And occasionally you'll see someone, for example, after a wrist fracture, where they're trying to uh, make a fist and they start bringing their, their wrist into flexion and they try to make a fist and they can't do it. And you just need to kind of reset them and let them understand that wrist extension and finger flexion are synergistic. That's the motion that you want to reproduce. But we know that the excursion uh, is less and tenodesis is required for these synergistic transfers because as I said, the wrist flexors and extensors only have about 30 millimeters of excursion and you're gonna need 50 to augment the digital extensors and 70 to augment the digital flexors. Next thing is an expendable donor. You obviously don't wanna take uh, one muscle to use as a transfer and then cause a loss of function uh, from that particular donor site. And so we're fortunately have redundancy built in. So for example, wrist flexion, we have the FCR, the FCU, and the palmaris longus, which is certainly weak, but does provide some degree of wrist flexion. And what that does enables us to uh, utilize one and then still maintain the initial motion of wrist flexion and use that other tendon for augmentation or for a transfer, for example, for digital extension. And so you also need to maintain one extensor and one flexor for each digit. So in a person that has normal uh, function of the hand and median nerve function, we can take the FDS because we're gonna maintain the FDP. And the extensor side of the hand, we have some built-in redundancy with the EIP to the index finger and the EDQ to the small finger. And this will enable us to use those in some situations for tendon transfers because we can still maintain the finger extension from the uh, second extensor. And so thinking about tendon transfers versus nerve transfers. Um, there's certain things and certain principles that uh, you want to consider and what things to consider with both of these, what things are maybe more important for a tendon transfer and a nerve transfer. So when you think about having an expendable donor, synergy and adequate strength, 
these are important for nerve transfers or tendon transfers. But when you start thinking about some of the other things, a straight line of pull, this is really more important for a tendon transfer. The nerve transfers are a nerve repair. You want to be uh, somewhat supple and have some redundancy. You don't want uh, real tension on a nerve repair or a nerve transfer. And with the tendon transfer, you need a certain amount of tension and a straight line or a straight path. Same thing when you think about uh, matched excursion and amplitude. This is really important for tendon transfers to have adequate amplitude. Doesn't have to be a consideration for nerve transfer. And one muscle, one function. Again, something important for tendon transfers that's really less of an issue from the standpoint of nerve transfers. And then one of the big advantages of tendon transfers are that you can have relatively immediate function. So you do your tendon transfer, you're gonna expect that when they come out of their surgical dressing or their cast within a few weeks, they're gonna start to begin, uh, start to begin regaining that function. With a nerve transfer, it's gonna take some time. Even if you transfer it close to the muscle, you still have to have your norepine connect and then that muscle become re -innervated. Um, Nerve transfer is probably better in younger patients than older patients, as opposed to tendon transfers, where really age is much less of a consideration. And realizing age is a moving target as I get older, uh, but thinking about that, a, a nerve repair in a 20-year-old is going to be uh, is more likely to do well than a nerve repair in a 50-year-old, which is more likely to do better than a nerve repair in an 80-year-old. And when there's not been uh, previous regeneration, uh, then you need to think about that. Nerve regeneration is not an issue uh, for tendon transfers. Just a point about arthrodesis. We generally avoid this when we are thinking about tendon transfers or nerve palsies, because you often can rely on motion at one joint to help augment, as I described, the excursion. And so you avoid arthrodesis if we've done an arthrodesis of the wrist, and you're going to try to transfer a wrist flexor for finger extension, you no longer have that additional augmentation to get from 30 millimeters to 50 millimeters of excursion. So how do we classify these and think about these? If you break them into broad categories, nerve injuries can be considered high, and those are generally around the elbow or low, which are generally around the wrist, with the radial nerve being a little bit different because uh, you can have above the elbow radial nerve and you can have below the elbow or just at the elbow level, just the isolated PIN. But the median nerve and ulnar nerve, generally a low nerve injury or a low nerve palsy is going to be at the wrist as opposed to the higher one, which is around the elbow. And then you can have an isolated nerve injury, such as an isolated radial nerve injury or a combined median and ulnar nerve injury, which you see, and those become uh, more complicated. In general, when you look at nerve injuries, the more complicated the problem generally the easier your solution or the more straightforward your solution needs to be because you're much less likely to become uh, successful the more structures there are that are in injured. So how do you figure out what to do? If you look at some of the textbooks and you start reading about a brand transfer, a, a voice transfer, all these different transfers uh, that have names based on people who describe them or popularize them, I think that rather than understanding the names of the types of transfers, you just need to understand what the transfers are. And I find this kind of thought process very helpful. So what do you need? What do you have? And what is expendable? And if you go through each of these categories and you can answer the questions, you're going to come up with the right answer almost every time for what your choices are for a tendon transfer, uh, whether it is from spasticity, whether it is from a peripheral nerve injury. So when we go through this and think about a patient that has an EPL rupture, how do you figure out what the right transfers are, what the best transfer would be? So if a patient has an EPL fracture or EPL rupture, what do you need? Well, you need thumb extension because they've lost the ability to extend the thumb because even though they have an EPB, they can't extend their terminal IP joint. And so what are your options for transfers? How do you figure out what to do? Well, in this situation, you have everything except the EPL. And then you think about, okay, what is expendable? And the things that you would uh, potentially think about, you could use your index or small finger extensor. You could use your EPB, or you could use your palmaris longus tendon. You wouldn't want to take the middle finger extensor because that's not expendable. You'd be left with an ability to extend the middle finger. Uh, and so those are the ones that are commonly thought about for thumb extension. Index or small finger extensor, because there's duplicated there, the EPB or the palmaris longus. So clinical example of this, you can see how the patient, in spite of their effort to extend, has uh, resistant or a persistent IP flexion. Uh, 
So here we're going to do the, uh, the transfer here. We're gonna take the EIP uh, at the level of the MP joint. I like to take it out of the extensor retinaculum and then tunnel it subcutaneously. Uh, here we can see the distal stump of the EPL identified with where this was ruptured. And so when you bring them together and do your tenorophy, the next thing that you need to figure out, or before you do your tenorophy, the thing that you need to figure out is setting the tension and how tight does that need to be? And if you look at a Blix curve, there's an optimal point from the standpoint of the muscle. That's hard to, to translate what you can see in a lab or what you can see described into a clinical situation. And so I always err on the side of getting it about where I think it needs to go and then making it just a little bit tighter. Of all the tenon transfers that I've done, it's very unusual to have something that's too tight. I can't ever recall having to go back later and revise that because it's too tight. But I have plenty of them that I look at and think, gosh, I wish I made that a little bit tighter. I would have had a little better result if it was a little bit tighter. So err on the side of making it a little bit tight. And so here you can see the example after the tenorophy is done over the base of the metacarpal. And then we use tenodesis motion to check this. So we know when the wrist is in neutral, that thumb should be pretty much extended. And then as we bring the wrist into flexion because of tenodesis, the EPL is going to uh, become tighter. And you can see in the top center picture here, a little bit of hyperextension at the uh, IP joint of the thumb. As we bring the wrist back into flexion, now you can see the thumb starts to flex as it goes into pinch. And so that's kind of the tension that you want on that if you're doing this with the patient asleep, you can rely on tenodesis to determine that. The other option is to do this with the patient wide awake under straight local anesthesia, and then you can have them actively move. And there's definitely some advantages to doing it that way uh, from a standpoint of getting the tension set most optimally with the tendon transfer. So when we think about radial nerve palsy, this is the next one. So the uh, EPL rupture is, is certainly a great one to think about and start understanding these principles. So let's go through a radial nerve palsy. If you have a low radial nerve palsy, think about this as really distal to the takeoff of the wrist extensor. So you've lost thumb and finger extension, but you still have some wrist extension, at least with radial deviation. So your ECL, ECRL innervation comes off before the ECRB. And so if you can extend the wrist, even if it's radially deviated, then you only have to worry about finger and thumb extension. If you can't extend the wrist, then you have to think about what are we gonna to do to restore wrist extension as well as thumb extension and finger extension. So it becomes a little bit more complicated from that standpoint, but radial nerve palsies are fairly common. And I think of the tendon transfers that hand surgeons generally do, these are pretty predictable and you can get a pretty consistent good result with radial nerve transfers. And so for low, you're missing the, or you're, you're missing the thumb extension. So one of the things that we'll often think about is palmaris longus to EPL, assuming they have a palmaris longus tendon. And then for the fingers, you can use the FCR, the FCU, the FDS, the ring. And as I said, names that are traditionally associated with this, but I think the important thing to think about is just anatomically, we could use these to uh, restore finger extension. And with this, you're gonna have, you're gonna maintain one donor. So if you take the FCR, you're still gonna have the FCU. If you take the FCU, you're still gonna have the FCR. And if you take the FDS, for example, of the ring or FDS of the middle, you're still gonna have FDPs to flex the fingers. And then the pretty common one, if you need wrist extension is pronator tears to ECRB. Assuming that's present, that's the one that's most predictable and used almost consistently. So if you ever see this on an exam, there are questions about, you know, what would you take the FCR, the FCU? And I think there's probably more surgeon preference than there is hard data to say one is necessarily better or not as good as the other. But certainly the standard for wrist extension is the pronator tears to ECRB transfer. So here's an example of uh, this patient uh, with a radial nerve palsy. So they have a high radial nerve palsy, meaning they've lost wrist extension, finger extension and thumb extension. And so those are the things that you need, wrist, finger, and thumb extension. So what are your options? What can you transfer? Well, in this situation, we have everything that's innervated by the median nerve or the ulnar nerve. And so when you think about the thought process of what I'm gonna do, since we have all median and ulnar nerve innervated uh, muscles, we could use any of these. So my choice is gonna be pronator teres to ECRB, which as I said, is the standard wrist extensor transfer. And then I like the FCR to the EDC. Uh, and that's my preferred transfer for finger extension in this situation. 
And then palmaris longus to EPL. The palmaris longus is not very strong, but you don't need much strength to extend the thumb. So you have adequate strength. You have generally adequate excursion for that. The reason I like the FCR better than the FCU for radial nerve palsy is I think the FCU, as we know, is much stronger and more important for the dart thrower's uh, motion. We also know that the FCR is relatively expendable. You think about the days of ligament reconstruction, tendon interposition, arthroplasty, and how that's commonly been uh, done with the FCR harvested. And patients generally function very well with loss of the FCR. So those are my preferences for a high radial nerve palsy. And here you can see the exposure. We have the pronator terrace, the FCR, and the palmaris longus, uh, each harvested here, getting ready to bring them around. Pronator terrace being transferred into the ECRB the FCR into the EDC, which I grouped together, and then the palmaris longus into the EPL to restore thumb extension. So I've used essentially one tendon for one function, the pronator teres for wrist extension, the FCR for finger extension, and the palmaris longus for thumb extension. As long as I've created a straight line, I have a pretty good chance of having a reasonable result with this tendon transfer. And so here you can see uh, this is an example of a patient six months out. If we look at it, wrist extension and finger extension, he's not actually extending fully, but in this situation, I definitely didn't get the tension set perfectly because you can see his index finger is just a little bit tighter than the middle finger and the ring finger and the small finger. And so when he flexes down, he's good, but when he extends, he uh, can hyperextend the index finger and the other three kind of go to about neutral. There you can see bringing the thumb across the palm and then extending the thumb uh, demonstrating EPL function after the transfer. So let's talk about median nerve palsy. With low median nerve palsies, what do you need? You really need opposition of the thumb. And that's the big downside to not having a low median nerve. And we think about opposition, this is a combination of flexion, palmar abduction, and pronation. And if you have a high median nerve injury or an injury around the elbow, you have the same thing that you need, opposition, but now you've also lost thumb and potentially index and middle finger flexion. So it becomes a little bit more complicated uh, as it's a higher level injury. And so when you think about the low, what can we do to create thumb opposition? Well, if everything else works, you have a lot of good transfers. You can use the FDS of the ring. You can use the EIP. The palmaris longus, or what's referred to as the camas transfer, is not a bad transfer for this, but it's really more of an abductor plasty than an opposition transfer. It helps you bring the, th excuse me, the thumb away from the palm, but it doesn't actually get that pronation that you need to create true opposition. The abductor digit and minimi transfer is something that's more commonly done in kids than adults. I've done it a handful of times in adults as well, and it actually can provide a pretty good transfer. And then one of the advantages of that, particularly in kids that have, for example, hypoplastic thumbs, is when you move that muscle, it does recreate a little bit of the thenar bulk that may not be there or that's lost uh, if they have a nerve injury with a long time uh, of denervation to the thenar muscles. And so it can give a little bit of a bulk and, and more normal appearance. And then for a high median nerve injury, uh, you wanna create uh, something that will provide opposition. And then you need thumb flexion and index and middle finger flexion. So the breaker radialis to the FPL is something that works very well. It's in a good proximity to that. As we know, the breaker radialis is very strong. And so that can help with uh, forceful pinch. And then to recreate index and middle finger flexion, easiest thing to do is just transfer the uh, FDPs of the index and middle side to side to the ring and small, which are ulnar nerve innervated uh, always. And you can provide full composite flexion with those transfers. So let's talk about ulnar nerve palsy. It becomes more complicated as you go from uh, radial nerve to median nerve. And I think ulnar nerve is one step further. And uh, ulnar nerve transfers are hard to get just right in my experience. They're not as common as radial nerve transfers. And so some of it is probably the individual surgeon's experience with these, but also getting them in the right place, minimizing the scarring and uh, having the optimal uh, tension on these transfers because of what you're doing becomes much harder than the gross uh, grasp or the gross uh, finger extension and thumb extension that you're looking for with radial nerve transfers. And when I see a patient with ulnar nerve palsy, what I really wanna figure out is what is their problem? Because sometimes what we think is their problem as a surgeon is not what the patient's problem is. So you think, oh, you know, ulnar nerve palsy, they have 
uh, clawing to the ring and small fingers, we need to address this. But if they say, you know, that's a little bit annoying, but I can do what I need to do. My problem is I can't pinch, then, you know, that's what you need to address or vice versa. And so when you think about power pinch, one good way to do that is with the ECRB or brachioradialis plus a graft. And you can tie this into the adductor pollicis. Uh, and you can also do a, a two-tail graft and go into the first dorsal interosseus. So now they have adduction of the thumb. And then if their index finger is really unstable due to loss of the ulnar innervated intrinsics, going into the first, first dorsal osseus with the other tail of that graft will help stabilize it. So when they pinch, that index finger doesn't want to give out. The other thing that uh, happens with the uh, ulnar nerve palsy is because of uh, loss of the intrinsics, they can create clawing. And then you need to figure out, do you need to do a static transfer or a dynamic transfer? And one of the questions or one of the things that often will come up when you're thinking about low ulnar nerve palsy, or you have, an, uh, for example, a high ulnar nerve injury, and initially the patient doesn't have any clawing. And then as they start to recover, they develop clawing. And then the concept of, oh, something's gone wrong, they're developing clawing now is something that actually is a good sign of re because to develop clawing, you have to have an intact uh, FDP muscle and FDS muscle, because if you don't, you won't get the flexion that's needed to go along with the unopposed uh, intrinsics. So clawing is indicative of the proximal nerve working and the distal nerve not working. And when you have that, the Bouvier's maneuver to test this is merely by blocking the hyperextension. So if their MP joints hyperextend and you can block them and they can fully extend their PIP joints, then you have more options. If you block the hyperextension and they still have trouble extending those IP joints, then you're gonna to need to do some sort of a dynamic transfer rather than just a static transfer to block the hyperextension. And so when you think about the transfers or the options for uh, clawing, the FDS of the middle and ring finger can be transferred into the uh, lateral band or the proximal phalanx. The lateral band is going to create a more dynamic transfer, so it's going to give you more excursion. But again, getting the tension set just right can be a bit of a challenge. Uh, a Zancoli lasso procedure, where you essentially take the FDS and just loop it around the A1 pulley and back to itself, is a static transfer. But the idea behind that is if you block the MP hyperextension and they can fully extend, you can just do a transfer to block that hyperextension of the MP joint, and they can do okay. And that the lasso around the A1 pulley works well. Uh, you can try augmenting the volar plate. That's apt to stretch out. And that's one of the things with these transfers is they, they often will stretch out over time. And then the other option as mentioned here in the bottom is ECRB tendon with a graft to help uh, augment the, uh, the strength of this. So when you think about ulnar nerve palsy, you can have high, uh, which also now has the same things with the low nerve palsy. So the pinch problems and the uh, hyperextension or the clawing, and you've also lost flexion of the ring and small finger. In that situation, transferring the ring and the small to the FDP of the index middle should restore finger flexion. And then you're back to the uh, challenges of a low ulnar nerve palsy to think about for your tendon transfer. I think it's important to think about rehabilitation after uh, tendon transfers. I generally will mobilize these for about three to four weeks, depending on the transfer. And some of this is really based kind of on what we were taught. I'm not sure there's science to necessarily say four weeks is better than two weeks. And when you think about it, if we do a tendon repair, for example, a flexor tendon repair, we know that we want to move these patients pretty early. And in that situation, we're really just doing an end-to-end -to -end tenorothy as opposed to the transfers where you're generally doing some type of a weave, a pulver taft type weave, a side to side transfer or something. So that's technically probably a much stronger transfer and we can probably move these patients a little bit earlier. But part of it is just protecting it, letting the soft tissues and everything settle down because generally these are big incisions that you're making uh, when you're doing the transfer. So you let those heal and then you begin the rehab program. And so I generally start by trying to maintain passive motion make sure the joints stay stupple, uh, and then we progress to active motion without resistance. And as they get stronger, then we start working on strengthening as that tendon recovers its strength and heals over a period of, of four to six weeks. Again, as I said earlier, we know that synergistic, synergistic transfers are much easier for the patients to learn. Um, if they've had some sort of an injury, uh, or even without that, just the concept of 
finger flexion and wrist extension is much easier than, for example, if you're going to take the FDS of the middle and ring to try to restore finger extension, because it's not as intuitive to think about, I want to straighten my fingers out. And to do that, I have to bend them down. But it is intuitive to think, I want to straighten my fingers out. I'm going to bend my wrist down. And you can show the patients this pretty easily so they seem to understand it. So let's look at another case, kind of to start to round things up here. 42-year-old, high median and high ulnar nerve injury 18 months prior to presentation. So when you think about this, we know that it's complicated because it's median and ulnar nerve together. It's complicated because it's high. That means they've lost the finger flexion uh, as well as the opposition, as well as pinch, and as well as clawing if they have some recovery. If they don't have clawing, it just means that the injury is proximal to the, uh, the muscle bellies. And when both of those are injured, they're probably not going to have clawing unless they're getting some recovery. In this situation, the patient had to repair with nerve conduits and no return of function 18 months after the injury. So we know if we're going to think about other options, such as a nerve transfer, we need to re-innervate those muscles before the, motor, before the uh, muscles undergo uh, degeneration of the motor implants. So if you're going to do a transfer of a nerve, you generally would like to do this by about nine months to give adequate time for uh, the nerve to connect and the nerve to regenerate and get into the muscle. But once you get uh, 15, 18 months, it makes it much less predictable. And you get much outside of 18 months, it's probably hard to consider a nerve transfer for motor function reasonably. It still may be some benefit from the standpoint of regaining sensory function, and that can occur much later. So combined high median and high, nerve, high ulnar nerve palsies. How do you go through the thought process to figure out what you want to do as far as tendon transfers? So you go through back to this table, like I mentioned earlier, what do you need, what do you have, and what is expendable? And so when you think about what we need, we've lost median and ulnar nerve function. And as I said, the more complicated the injury, the simpler your solution should be. And so for this, we want to have finger flexion, thumb flexion, and to some degree, uh, wrist flexion. It would be nice to be able to have power pinch. It would be nice to be able to have abduction and adduction. That's probably not realistic to gain those. So let's go for what we can do to potentially help this patient out. And then the limitate, there are also limitations when you think about the what do you have portion of the table. Well, we've lost all median nerve and all ulnar nerve innervated muscles. So the only thing we have are radial nerve inner muscles. And then when we think about what's expendable, now we go through the process realizing we must save one finger extensor, one wrist extensor, and the thumb extensors. So how are you going to reconstruct this combined median and ulnar nerve injury to try to give them some degree of finger flexion, thumb flexion, uh, and wrist flexion? And so when you think about those, this is what we uh, decided to do based on having the radial nerve innervated muscles to try to regain wrist flexion, finger flexion, and thumb flexion. We know that if we can flex the fingers and flex the thumb, those will some degree provide wrist flexion. They're not as strong, but in this situation, at least probably give you some wrist flexion by making a fist. And so when we go through the process, here's what we decided to do. The ECRB to the FDP. So we've got one of the wrist extensors. We chose to take the central wrist extensor here because we still have the ECRL and the ECU. And the ECU is kind of a wrist extensor. It's an extensor if the form is supinated. When the forearm's pronated, it's really more of an ulnar deviator than an extensor. But the central wrist extensor is the best one for this because it maintains the balance. If we were to take the ECRL, you'd probably end up having some ulnar deviation of the wrist. And for this transfer, I like to go through the interosseous membrane. It creates a straight line. You want to make sure you have an opening in the interosseous membrane that's wide enough that it doesn't get stuck in scar. So I essentially cut out a segment that's about two centimeters by two centimeters to make sure that with that straight path, there's no, uh, if there's smooth gliding and no uh, kinking of that tendon or any place that it's caught up. And then to get thumb flexion back, the brachioradialis to the FPL uh, works well. And so this is the example of that. So we go brachioradialis to FPL and ECRB to FDP, and that should give us some finger flexion, thumb flexion, and by proxy, some wrist flexion as well. So here you can see everything kind of pulled together uh, in a fashion, it's all brought together uh, as one. So the idea is just to create composite finger flexion. They're not gonna get into independent motion, not gonna be a pianist after this, but potentially be able to grasp and hold, which the patient couldn't do prior to this.
And so here you can see kind of the tenodesis motion. This patient had pre-existing uh, PIP and DIP contractures to some degree. We tried to improve them, but still left a little bit stiff as you can see here. And here we are about six months afterwards. So existing uh, contractures, but you, uh, the PIP and the DIP joints, so that's not fully centered, but you can see the MP flexion that we have about 90 degrees with this transfer to bring the fingers in. And then you can see the IP flexion of the thumb. You can see that uh, it's got some ability to come in and pinch. It's not true opposition, but he can pinch the side of the, uh, the thumb to the lateral aspect of the index finger or middle finger from a standpoint of pinch. And so my pearls for success when thinking about tendon transfers, passive mobilization as soon as this injury is diagnosed, you wanna set realistic expectations. This is not gonna be the same as it was prior to the injury or prior to the condition that occurred, but generally we can restore uh, some degree of function and make the hand a very useful, good helper hand and a lot of things can be done independently. You wanna make sure your transfer goes through supple tissue with minimal scar. Tension a little bit tight rather than a little bit loose. And this is something where you really need an outstanding hand therapist for it. There are many things that we do um, where a general therapist, uh, occupational therapist or physical therapist that maybe doesn't have as much expertise in hand can do an excellent job. For example, metacarpal fractures, a lot of those uh, just need a little bit of guidance, but tendon transfers, uh, nerve transfers, those types of things, having a good hand therapist, I think is essential for having a good outcome. And so in summary, you're gonna use a functional unit to replace a lost function. In some situations, preoperative therapy to assess the patient's compliance and the ability to perform the postoperative therapy uh, as needed can be helpful. And you wanna make sure that the patient understands what they're going through, that they're committed to this because you do surgery for tendon transfers. If they don't follow up, if they don't follow directions uh, or are not compliant, and you probably haven't helped them out too much and you've uh, spent a lot of time and effort for something that's likely to be unsuccessful. So I appreciate your time. I appreciate your attendance. Hopefully this gives you uh, a little bit of an idea of some of my thoughts about tendon transfers and how you think about these problems and how we go forward with it. So